this is, this is all very exciting. I feel a little bit like Lady Gaga with the whole boxes coming out and all of that. It's very nice. Yeah. So, so uh, but before I go in, in, into what we are doing at the Khan Academy, and we're doing a lot more than, than just the videos, what I want to do is, is show you all a little bit of a, a montage of what the Khan Academy is at least now most known for, but I think that's changing a little bit. And then we'll talk about what we're doing now and, and, then, and, and where we're going. Sound is a capital sigma. All of these interactions are just due to the gravity over interstellar, or almost you could call it intergalactic. So the right slot is I plus one. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America, a nice clean band here. They create the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds like a very nice committee. Notice this is an aldehyde and it's an alcohol. It's some type of an infectious disease. Exactly, so the key is when you start to look at data, you have to look at all aspects of it. Ours is their 30 million plus the $20 million from the American manufacturer. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. There's a... So, so now the, the, uh, what, what's now become the Khan Academy, and I'll talk a little bit more in depth of how it became the Khan Academy. Uh, where we are right now, we've had over, uh, oh, actually it's now over 90 million. That slide's a little bit old, it's a few days old. We've now had over 90 million uh, lessons delivered, over 100 million exercises done, and I'll show you all what it means to do an exercise on the Khan Academy. And we have, as of this past month, three and a half million unique students per month using the site. And, and you know, it, it, whenever you, we read about the internet, we're used to reading about a million here, a million there, 10 million, 100 million, but we lose sight about how large these numbers really are. And just to give you a little context, and I'm not just picking on Harvard, I'm just cho choosing them because they're kind of, they're an older school. Uh, the number of students we had last month is six times the number of students that Harvard has had in its history. And we're, and we're, and we're growing much faster as well. So, so that, that's, that, that, that's where we are right now, uh, but it, 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 it started in a kind of very almost random, organic way. Uh, if you rewind back to 2004, I was a, an analyst at a hedge fund in Boston. Uh, we later moved the fund out to the uh, uh, near San Francisco. And I had some cousins visiting me after my wedding, and one in particular, Nadia, was having trouble with mathematics. And, uh, I had trouble believing this. She was a very smart girl. Uh, we, we shared a certain amount of DNA. And, 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 and so I, uh, I, I told Nadia, I said, how about when you go back to New Orleans, uh, we, we figure out some way to, to, to tutor each other or that I can get on a phone and I tutor you. And, and she agreed. And so I started doing this long distance tutoring with her after work. I would go and I'd get on a phone. I would tutor Nadia. We'd work through problems. We ended up using uh, Instant Messenger to Yahoo Doodle and Yahoo Instant Messenger to share problems and to look at problems together and work through them. And she, she ended up progressing. Then I started doing it with her brothers, and I started having a bunch of family friends all around the country that I started tutoring while, while I had this day job. And uh, I also started kind of the primitive version of, of the software that you're about to see so I could give my cousins practice. But in 2006, I... Uh, I, I, I I was showing my friend this little software I was writing, and I was showing him, you know, I'm, I'm tutoring my cousins, and I'm doing all this stuff. And I said, my only problem that I'm having is, is that I'm still having trouble scaling these tutorial sessions, that I give this one lecture to Nadia, the next week, I, I wish Ali was there. The week after that, I wish Sasha was there when I, when I give the lecture to Nadia. Or sometimes I feel like maybe Nadia forgot something, and she's afraid to, to let me know. She's afraid that I'm going to judge her. And, and my buddy, he, he said, well, why don't you just take your lectures and, and, and put them on YouTube? And uh, I, I was like, no, 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 you know, not, not YouTube. You know, YouTube's for, for cats playing piano. It's, it's not for, for serious mathematics. Um, but I, I went home that weekend, and I kind of got over the idea that it wasn't my idea. And I, um, and, and I, and I, and I gave it a shot. And that started a whole cascade of, I, I would say, very interesting events. Uh, the first was the feedback from my cousins. I, I said, hey, why don't you just take a look at this stuff? It could be a supplement to what we're doing, these, these tutorial sessions. And the very first feedback that they gave me, very unintuitive feedback and slightly backhanded feedback, but the very first feedback that they gave me was that they liked me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and... Uh, it, 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 it's slightly backhanded, but when you, and, and very unintuitive, because here they were saying that they preferred an automated version of their cousin to their cousin. 
They, they liked the scalable version of me as opposed to the, the resource-intensive version of me. But when you look at it from the student's point of view, it makes a ton of sense. They could now pause and repeat their cousin. They could rewind their cousin. They could, uh, if, if there was a concept from second grade or third grade and now they're in seventh grade, they're embarrassed. They wouldn't want to ask me that they forgot how to borrow or multiply decimals or uh, add negative numbers. Now they can watch that video and have, and have no fear of being judged. And they can watch it at the right time when they're ready for it. You know, maybe sometimes when you do the live tutorial, um, you, you know, the boy that Nadia had a crush on maybe asked another girl to the dance, and now we're trying to do mathematics. But now she could do it when she's ready for it. And maybe some days I wasn't on, but now when I'm doing the video, I can make sure that I have the, the best energy. So that was kind of interesting feedback. They kept watching the videos. It was on YouTube. Random people started watching it, which was kind of exciting for me. And interesting things, you know, I, I just kept making videos, more and more videos. And then I started getting comments from some of these people. And some of the comments were just very nice. Um, thank you, um, this really helped. And, you know, just that is pretty big. I don't know if you've ever spent some time on YouTube. Um, most of the comments on YouTube are not particularly uh, positive, <laughs> so, so to speak. Uh, but just that got me pretty excited. I was like, look, you know, I, I could be shaving or going out with friends or whatever, and I'm somehow teaching these kids all over the world. And so I kept going, and then I started getting letters from people saying, this is the reason I was able to pass algebra. Or this is the reason that I'm able to go back to college. Or my son has dyslexia and this is the only uh, medium that, that's getting across to him. And, and my family is praying for you. And, and, and you could imagine how I felt. You know, I was, a, I was an analyst at a hedge fund. Uh, I, I wasn't used to people saying that they were praying for me. <laughs> so, so uh, the site traffic kept growing. I, I, by 2009, I just frankly had trouble focusing on my day job. Uh, so I, I uh, and this was the fourth time that I was tempted to quit, but this time I actually did, uh, hoping, and we set it up as a not-for-profit, um, ho hoping that, that, that some foundation, someone would notice that, that this is worth doing. And uh, like a lot of entrepreneurial, although this is kind of a social entrepreneur, it, you know, I don't own the Khan Academy. It's, a, it not, it's an NGO or not-for-profit. Uh, about nine months went by, but then after nine months, I got a, um, a little PayPal link, and most people were donating $5, $10, $15. All of a sudden, I got a $10,000 donation. And uh, the woman's name was Ann Doer, and I uh, immediately emailed her back. I said, you know, thank you. Um, if, if we were a physical school, you would not have a building named after you. Uh, and... and uh, she was local in, in near San Francisco, and so she said we should meet. And when we met, she said, well, how are you supporting yourself if this was the largest donation you've ever gotten? And I kind of said, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, so so uh, she kind of nodded a little bit, and then when I went home that day, she sent me a text message saying, well, I've just wired you $100,000. You can support yourself now. So, so, so that was a good day. That was a... That was a um. And then start, things started getting really crazy. Uh, that July... All of a sudden, I got a text message from Ann, the same Ann Doerr, saying that she's at a conference like this. Bill Gates is on stage, and he's talking about you. And I didn't know whether there was a joke or she sent it to the wrong person or whatever. Um, but then I looked on Twitter, and it, it was true. Uh, so people were tweeting about it and all this. And, and, and I said, what do I do now? Do, do, do I call him? Do I? <laughs> what's, the, what's, the, what's the etiquette? Uh, so so the, the next, um, you know, and I was literally sitting in a closet making videos. Uh, so, so literally the next two weeks were very awkward for me, and then I finally get a call from uh, Bill Gates' chief of staff, and he, um, he says, Bill is a fan, you might have heard, and he would like to meet if you, if you have time. And uh, I, I was looking at my calendar at the time, and it, it, it was completely blank. <laughs> and I said, yeah, sure, you know, maybe like Wednesday 2.45, I can just fit, fit, him, fit him right in. So we met. So he decided to support us. Uh, Google also decided to support us. Uh, this is very recent. This is actually o only a little over a year ago. Um, and with that support, obviously, um, it's, it's, some of it is to, to support me, uh, to, to, to just be able to do this. But most of the resources are to really turn the Khan Academy into what we think is a virtual school, into something that can educate any student anywhere for free. And what we see right here in the, in the, on the slides, this is what we're starting to build, actually what we've already built out a good bit. This is what we call our knowledge map, and it's really an extrapolation of what I started building for my cousins. 
And you saw a little bit of the videos. Each of these nodes that you see there are uh, a, an exercise module. It will generate as many types of questions, as many questions as you need in that concept type. So the top one is basic addition, one plus one, two plus three. As a student masters it, then it, it brings them down to each of those nodes. And right now our knowledge map goes through trigonometry, calculus, and by the end, within a year, we're hoping that it also covers chemistry and physics, and we really want this to expand to cover as much knowledge as possible. So anything that can be taught in this way, uh, we are offering. And it seems like a very obvious thing to do. Don't proceed to a next concept until you've mastered a, an existing one. That's how you learn to do everything else. If, you, know, you wouldn't learn to ride a unicycle until you've really learned to ride a bicycle. And as intuitive that, as that is, and as, that, as, as much as that's how every, you learn in every other natural way in life, that's the complete opposite of what's happening in, in schools. Right now in schools, what we do is we have a fixed calendar, and we have a fixed amount of time to learn something. So the next two weeks, we're going to learn negative numbers. And at the end of that two weeks, we give everyone an assessment, and the variable is how well you learn the negative numbers. Some people get A's, some people get B's, some people get C's. The, even the A student might have 5% wrong, B student has 10, 15%, C student has 20% wrong. And even though you've identified those gaps in your knowledge, the whole class moves on to the next concept. And, you know, it, 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 we're so used to this that it doesn't seem strange, but think of that same mindset in any other field. Imagine if we were building a house, and we build the foundation, and the inspector comes and says, That's an, that, that foundation is only 80% sound. You say, oh, great, that's a C, that passes, let's build the first floor. But that's exactly what's happening. Then you build the second floor, even though the first floor is only 80% sound. Then you build it, and eventually you're surprised when the whole thing collapses. But that's exactly what's happening in our education system. We have a student gets a C on exponents, that's passing, you didn't know 20% of the material, now do fractional exponents, now do negative exponents. And we're shocked that they don't know, they're not able to do it, now do algebra. And so we're saying do it the other way, instead of holding fixed the amount of time you have to learn something, and the variable is how well you learn it, why don't we hold fixed the standard that everyone should master it? Everyone should become a 100% student, and the variable is how long you have to learn it. And so that's, that's the paradigm that we're doing right here. And so this is what one of those modules looks like. This is one to understand the intuition of what a derivative is. You can plot, you can put the, change the slopes of the tangent lines, and it kind of plots out the derivative function. This, this next slide is one where we show, let me get to the, one more. This is just another very basic, uh, this is basic subtraction. Once again, students get as many problems as they need to master it. If they don't know how to do a specific problem, the steps are right there, the hints are right there, the videos that you saw earlier are there to complement it. And by the way, half of Google's funding for us is to translate it into 12 languages now, and Spanish is, uh, we'll be releasing it very shortly. So this isn't, this isn't something just in English. So this is, uh, this is, So when we, when we started this, um, we got the funding, we started building this idea of you know, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Uh, a, a local school district came up to us and said, well, this is very interesting. What would you do if you could do anything with the class? And we said, well, we'd have every student working at their own pace, mastering concepts before they move on. Now you wouldn't have to have a lesson plan that goes, moves everyone together. Instead of the teacher giving a lecture every day and kids, you know, some are lost, some are bored, I want the teacher to sit down next to students every moment and actually do one-on-one -on -one interventions. And so they actually agreed. They thought it was a good idea. So we did two pilots, two fifth grade classes and two seventh grade classes. And this is actually a dashboard from one of those fifth grade classes. And so this is real-time data that the teachers are getting. They literally walk around with their laptop or a tablet, and they see this. Each row there is a student in the class. Each column is one of those things that you saw in that first map structure, that graph structure. And the model is, is green means the student's already mastered the concept. Blue means that they're working on it, but there's no need for worry. Red means that they're working on it and the student is stuck. So instead of the teacher giving a lecture, the, student, the teacher can look at that in real time, and it shows up real time while they're walking around class and says, why don't I just sit and do a one-on-one -on -one tutorial with that student? Or even better, why don't I get one of those other students who have already mastered the concept, why don't I get them to teach that student? And one, they're gonna help their peers, and they're going to be able to learn, learn the subject matter even, even more deeply. 
And this goes to an important point. You know, at least in the U.S., there's this huge debate about what's the appropriate student-to-teacher ratio. You know, obviously, the lower the better. You get more attention. What we're saying is that's important. But what's even more important is the student-to-valuable time with the teacher ratio. So in a traditional classroom, teacher spends 90% of their time lecturing. Only 10% of their time is actually sitting next to students, understanding students, uh, mentoring students. Now 100% of their time is sitting next to students, mentoring students, guiding students. So we think, and this is the ironic thing, we're using technology to make the classroom more human. We're using technology to make it more interactive. We're allowing technology to improve that student to teacher to valuable time with the teacher ratio. So we didn't want to just give the teachers, you know, arbitrary, arbitrary, um, you know, data. We wanted to give, arm them with as much data as possible. So these are some of the reports that the teachers get so they can really so they can really dig deeper on what a, what a student is learning. This, la this actually shows granular problem by problem. And all of this is free. You can go right now. You can sign up your kids for this. You can get the data just like the, the same as these teachers have. And I actually believe there are some schools in Mexico that have already started doing it on their own. This is one report that we show the teacher. And it actually says a pretty powerful narrative. What this is, every line there's a student in the class. Horizontal axis is days in the class. Vertical is the number of modules completed. And what we're seeing over and over and over again is right when you start this, yeah, sure, some students race ahead and some students are a little bit further behind. And in a traditional model, I say those are the smart kids. These are not, they're not so smart kids. But when you let every kid work at their own pace, some of those kids that you thought were not so smart, you give them two weeks, three weeks, one month, two months, they become the second best kid in the class, the best kid in the class. So the same kid that you thought was slow or remedial two months ago, you now think is gifted two months later. And this, is keeps, this, keep, this keeps switching. And just to give you an idea of the energy of these classrooms, I'll show you this little, this quick video. From Mountain View, California, NBC's Kristen Welker has our story tonight. What makes fifth graders cheer? Would you believe math? Yes. I'm starting to really like that. These kids are learning with the help of Khan Academy, an online school. You got it right. Good job. Millipede. Videos that are interactive and fun, explaining difficult concepts in a conversational way. And there was actually a fun story when that reporter did that. So that shows you the energy level in those classrooms. But the reporter saw a little fifth grade girl, and that girl was doing trigonometry, which is normally 10th, 11th, 12th grade mathematics. And so the reporter sits down next to that fifth grade girl and says, do you think this is fifth grade mathematics? And she got a very mischievous grin on her face. And she goes, no, I think it's sixth grade. <laughs> so the district wanted real, to see what the results would actually look like. So this, this was what really amazed all of us. So this was the, the seventh grade classes that did this. These were actually remedial math classes. These were students who were actually having trouble with math. So in 2010, only 23% of them were at grade level. 6% were very, very below basic. After six months, we doubled the number of students who were at grade level. But this was the amazing thing. This was a remedial math class. These were kids that were deemed learning disabilities slow. After six months, 6% 6 of these kids were now deemed advanced. These are kids that the system said were slow, and now we're saying, no, not only are they up to speed, but they're ahead of the other kids. Now, I just want to leave you with one last video, which kind of tells you the testament of how much potential there is in the world if we just give people the tools uh, to, to really tap into it. So I'll show, I'll show you this, this is the last video. My name is Mark Halberstadt. Growing up, uh, I was really always a C student. I, I think I was really pretty much always pretty pitiful in school. I don't think I've ever gotten higher than a B plus in any math class ever, uh, particularly. I pretty much thought that the only thing I was good enough to do in college was major in music. And I went off and I uh, got a music degree in saxophone. But I, I sort of almost felt that it was more I was getting it because I was terrible at everything else. Kind of worked as a saxophone player for a few years. Really what I wanted to do was uh, do electrical engineering. And the last thing that I remember completely not getting was trig identities. So I went to YouTube and I did a search for trig identities and the Khan Academy was the first thing that popped up. Watched a bunch of videos in the trig playlist to kind of get caught up to speed. I watched all the videos in the calculus playlist. I watched all the videos in the physics playlist. Watched a bunch of videos on dividing decimals and even uh, on a subtraction by borrowing. I watched uh, a lot of videos on, on arithmetic. That was in 2007. I did that uh, until the fall of 2010. And in the 
fall 2010, I, uh, I took a leap and I decided to go, uh, go back to school and went to uh, Temple University, majored in electrical engineering, getting a second bachelor's. And keep in mind, I, I don't think I've ever gotten above a B plus in math classes, and I was really a straight C student growing up. And I just finished this year, first year back in college, I got a 4.0 GPA for the entire year. I got perfect scores on both of my calc final exams and also on my chemistry final exam. I ended uh, calculus, chemistry, both calculus classes, calc 1 and 2, and chemistry with an average higher than 100%. I, there are some Khan Academy videos that I probably listen to the same concept over 20 or 30 times, and there is no tutor in the world I could have paid to have sat next to me and repeated the same thing over 20 or 30 times without at least them getting a little bit judgmental, or at least them getting, thinking like, oh, well, this guy really is never going to get this concept, and he should just give up. Where the understanding really happened was watching those videos, and, and also working through the Khan Academy software and everything. The impact for me in my life, I, I really see it growing exponentially over the next 20 or 30 years. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. All right, thank you.